So I just want to welcome everybody to tonight's meetup. It's sponsored by Blit Tech. So thanks, Split, for all the food. And our speaker is going to be Nabil Al Sharif. He is the founder and security specialist at Blit Tech. He also is a software developer at Shelter Insurance. And he's a co organizer on Dev Come On. So let's all welcome Nabil. Hi, everybody. Uh, today, we're going to talk about Wi Fi and security, and we're going to do a little tour of the common attacks that you see on Wi Fi networks. And to do that, we're going to talk about uh, how Wi Fi networks are secured first. Uh, as Paul said, I'm Nabil Al Sharif. I'm a security consultant at Blip Tech, and I'm also a software developer at Shelter Insurance. And you can always email me at nabil at blit.tech. So what we're going to do is we're going to go over Wi-Fi security standards, and then we are actually going to crack into a network and read packets. I have a, if you guys have Wi-Fi, there is a little network that says hack me, and we're going to break into it with air quotes. The core issue with, with Wi-Fi and this wireless in general is that you do not have physical control. You don't have physical security. You cannot limit who can see and cannot see what's going on on your network. So your, you know, your access point is broadcasting all the packets, and anybody sitting in this, you know, for example, in this room or on the street can pick up those those packets and can broadcast packets too. If you have a wired network, then I can say only packets from this IP address or this MAC address can go down this wire. Or only packet or I will only accept packets from this IP address or this MAC address from this wire. So you can have a lot more physical control. You can make sure that all of your network connections are inside the building. So you can't have somebody connecting to your network from you know across the street or in the parking lot. I would say that this is probably the only issue that we're going that's going to be fundamental to wireless. Like, this is, the rest of the issues are protocol issues, bad cryptography, these kinds of things that we would see regardless of whether the implementation was a wireless network or not. But they don't so from that sense, I would say this is the only fundamental issue to wireless security. But all of the attacks that we're going to take, talk about take advantage of this aspect. So let's get started. First, we have web. This was kind of the first standard that ever came out for uh, wireless security. Wired equivalent privacy. And don't use it. It's dead, thank God. I want to talk to you guys about why and how it's dead. So this is how WEP works, basically. You have your plain text, which is your packet. And then you have an initialization vector and the secret key. And your secret key is the password. It, well, it's not the password. It's derived from the password. But you can pretty much say this is the password for the network. So it's not like... Each person is issued a key, or each connection is issued a key. There is the secret key. And so the initialization vector and the secret key are used as a seed for RC4, which, and then, you know, just plain RC4, and then you don't worry about the chucksum, just XOR. And then that's a ciphertext that gets transmitted in the wireless packet. But they append the initialization ve vector to the ciphertext. Now, in general, there's kind of debate over when and when the initialization vector could or could not be public, or you know, should be in plain text, whatever. In this situation, that was kind of what killed it. Because the total key, this whole thing, is 64 bits. There's 24 bits for the initialization vector. That leaves only 40 bits left for the secret key. So just by looking at the packets, I already have 24 bits of, of the key for RCA. 
<clears throat> and 24 bits is a very small space. So you can go through that in a couple hours of normal traffic. And an active attacker can make that go by a little bit quicker. So now I have a situation where I have two ciphertexts that I know were encrypted using the same key because the IV has been used twice. The secret part, the secret key doesn't change. So I have two ciphertexts of RC4 that are encrypted using the same key, which is a big no-no. That's kind of the core. The core thing about RC4 is you do not reuse the key. And so I'm not going to talk about the mechanics of that, but this is the issue with web. <clears throat> And looking at this, this is kind of like a how not to design things situation. Because regardless of the core issue of the IVs, you have a very static key. That's another issue. And the bit size is very small. So the core problem is that the initialization vector was used incorrectly with WEP. And that caused a key reuse with RC4, which was what broke WEP. WPA came in to replace WEP, thankfully. And WPA is actually pretty solid. Uh, surprisingly enough, I didn't know this before I started working on this little presentation. It's both a protocol and a certification program. So you can get WPA certified devices. WPA is a little big. It has a couple of modes. WA, WA, WPA personal is when you have just the standard, you know, wireless password, you type in the password to get into the network kind of a situation. It's what you see at homes and coffee shops, and it's by far the most deployed. You have WPA enterprise, where uh, the router will talk to an authentication server to check to see, oh, is this username and password allowed to log in? And there's lots of modes very complicated, so we're going to avoid WPA Enterprise for a little bit. And WPS, Wi-Fi Protected Setup. This is where you could push a button on your router or enter a pin on your device and voila, you would be connected to your wireless network so like you didn't have to type in the full password. Uh, use an 8-digit print. It's very broken, so disable it if you can. Uh, I'm not going to go into basically WPS because it's an eight-digit pin. That by itself means that there's a very small number of possible pins, so it's easy to go through them very quickly. And also, in the way that the WPS protocol works, is you get to know whether it's the first half or the second half of the pin that is bad. So that just cuts down the time even more. So mm -hmm. just disable it if you can. So WPA is a little bit more complicated than WEP, and we're going to talk about these keys apply to them all, but unless I say enterprise, I'm really talking about WPA personal, because that's going to be our focus. Uh, the first key is what's called the pairwise master key, and this is derived from the, per from the password in WPA personal, or uh, the enterprise authentication protocol parameters for enterprise. So, Basically, it is, it is the password. It is pairwise master keys, basically the password. And then the pairwise transient key. This is the key that is used when you are talking to the router. So each connection gets its own unique pairwise transient key. Unlike web, where it was just everybody got one key that was used for connecting and that was used for everything. Here, each connection gets its own pairwise transient key that it uses for, connect, for encrypting and decrypting its own traffic with the router. And it, it is made, well it's not made, it's derived by concatenating the pairwise master key, basically the password, and the announce is basically a random number generated by the access point. s nots is, again, a random number generated by the station which basically means the device connecting to the access point, your laptop or your, or your phone. The access point MAC address 
and this patient's MAC address. And then the last key is the group temporal key. And this is a key that is shared by all of the nodes connected to the network, and it is used for broadcast packets. So if you know I want to send a broadcast packet to everybody on the network, I would use the groupwise temporal key to send that out. <clears throat> so WPA has a handshake. This is how you establish that pairwise transient key, your specific key to the access point. And it starts off by the access point sends out a nonce and the counter to the station, to the device asking to connect to the network. And then the device, so my laptop for example, will construct the pairwise transient key because it has a pairwise master key, that's the shared secret it should already have. It just got the, the access point nonce in the left. It chooses the station nonce and then the access point MAC and the station MAC are just known. So it can create that pairwise transient key, and then it sends <coughs> its own nonce and what's called a message integrity control and the replay counter back to the access point. And it uses the, so it constructed the pairwise transient key, and then it uses that key to create that message integrity control. And that is what the access point knows that, oh, this station knows that secret key, because it was able to construct this, the message, the message integrity control uh, number correctly. So the access point verifies the message, and now it has the SNOS, so it can construct the, the well, actually, it has the SNOS so it can construct the pairwise transient key. So now it can verify the MIC. And then it sends that groupwise transient key, that whole key that's shared for everybody for broadcast, back to the station with another message control. And then the station, so my laptop will receive that message and verify that that message integrity control code is correct. And that way it knows that the access point knows the password. Because the access point couldn't construct it if it didn't know the password. And then it sends a confirmation and then now you are connected to the wireless access point. This is, this is what we're going to come into later is part of this handshake is if I'm reading this handshake in the clear, I have everything that I need to create that pairwise transient key myself, except for the, the password. So we're going to talk about that later because that's going to come into our demo. Basically this means that I can connect this, I can collect a set of packets, I can collect a set of wireless packets, and if those packets contain the initial connection between the access point and the device, then I have everything that I need to go back later in my own time, at my own leisure, just start guessing passwords, guessing passwords, guessing passwords, guessing passwords, until one clicks. And then I can reconstruct everything I need from there, not just to, and I can decrypt the traffic that was sent. So there is no what's called forward secrecy. So if I have this initial connection, then I can encrypt everything after that, decrypt everything after that. How often does the uh, ANOTS change? You said it was a random generated number. Yeah, so the ANOTS changes every connection. So does yeah. the SNOTS. Okay. So it, it, it should, let's say that way. It, it does. It does. It does. Right. It, it changes every connection. Um, it's not necessarily random, though. If we're going to get into the nitty gritty details, some access points will just increment, so they won't generate a random number, they will just increment the previous number, so, but, and that's not here nor there. All right. uh, WPA3 is kind of a recent beast that was announced August-ish. Uh, it is a new standard, it's 
going to come in and replace WPA2. It takes care of some of the issues that we talked about with WPA2. And it has a lot of uh, good things coming. And I want to say thank you to Matthew Benhoff because a lot of the information in these next few slides pretty much are stolen from him. So he deserves the credit. One of the things that it does is it has a more secure handshake. So it eliminates a dictionary attack and provides forward secrecy using SAE. What that means in human terms is they, for WPA3, they've come up and they said we're going to have a simultaneous authentication of equals. So the station doesn't trust the access point and the access point doesn't trust the station until they both authenticate. And part of that authentication process is that a key is generated and then that key that is generated from that authentication process is then used as the pairwise master key for the four-way handshake that we just talked about. So that means that, that, that even if I collect everything from the connection, I shouldn't be able, basically the SAE, this simultaneous authentication, prevents me from, from knowing the pairwise master key and then it is used in the connection so that means I can't start guessing passwords I have to guess really big random numbers which is a whole different game and that uh, pairwise master key changes with every connection too which means I get forward secrecy so if I connect you know if I connect uh, can't say that part now um, <clears throat> basically, if I know the key, the pairwise master key for one connection, that doesn't mean I know it for the next connection, the connection after that, and the connection after that. And it replaces WPS. Uh, this is a little complicated, but the idea is that instead of exchanging an eight-digit pin, you're exchanging a full public key that, and then they talk about ways to, that could, you know, you can use QR codes or Bluetooth or NFC to communicate that public key. And then that public key is used to create kind of a temporary authentication channel. And then a new pairwise master key is generated and communicated through that channel. And then that again is used for the four-way handshake. And then the last thing it does is it opens up the door for unauthenticated encryption. So I can have a wire, an open wireless network where anybody can connect, but my connection to that wireless network is now encrypted. And you know, in today's world, if you want to connect to a wireless network, you are either using WPA, not web because that sucks. You're either using WPA and thus you have a password, so it's not truly an open wireless connection. Or you have an open wireless connection where all the traffic's going over the network in the clear. With this, you can, you can agree on, it gives you a protocol to agree on the key between your device and the access point without having to have a password. It's just a key that they agree on that is used to encrypt the traffic in transit. So me sitting in the coffee shop collecting all the packets will not be able to read the traffic unfortunately. Any questions? Yeah, one question. I'm not sure if we're to that point yet, but I'm, I'm curious. Um, that's maybe I'll scope again, but um, is there a way that, that I, as a client, could, t could say, you know, that if someone wants to set up a, a, another um, a wireless access point that mimics mine trying to grab my information? Is there a way to, to, for me as a client to, to, to be able to verify through these protocols or somewhere else or somewhere else that you know that, that's not the right access point that I should be you know I should be connecting to it's you know it's the same name or whatever. Yes, you yes. In the middle of yeah. That? yeah, actually WPA. So back to the WPA okay. yeah. handshake. Mm -hmm. If let's say I am a bad uh, access point and I'm pretending to and I'm asking you to connect to me. Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen is I'm going to send you the knot, the access point knots. You 
know the pairwise master key, so you know that secret that you need to connect. And then you generate the S nonce, you have the A nonce, you have the MAC addresses. So you create the pairwise transient key, and then you send me the S nonce, and you send me a message integrity control that basically is think of it as like signing that message with that pairwise transient key. Okay. Okay. Now I have everything that I need to construct that pairwise transient key except for the password. So in the third part where the AP of Air, when I go and try to send you that global temporal key Part of that is I need to include a, include a message, uh, an authentication control block. I need to sign that message saying, here you go, signed by the access point and this pairwise transient key. When you get that, you're going to verify, but it's not going to work because I don't have the password. Because I don't have the password, I can't construct the pairwise transient key, and if I can't construct the pairwise transient key, I can't sign the message correctly. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Basically, when you get the message back, it just wasn't signed with the correct password, and you yeah. can detect that. Exactly. Which password are you talking about here? Because uh, say if I wanted sure to spoof the Netgear 50, uh -huh. so I have a password right there. Yes. I know yes. What, how to connect, so I can set up a Raspberry Pi in the man, man in the middle. Oh, oh. And then you could you would could connect to that if I'm overpowering the Netgear 50. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That's if right. you have the password. If, yeah. if you yeah, have the password, the password, then you can mimic the access point. Right. Yes. Yeah. If you have the password, then you can mimic the, the password, the access point. And kind of almost by definition, there's no way around it. Like, they, you know, if there is no secret mm -hmm. right. that some party doesn't have, you know, basically, if I know all the things I need, then I can mimic whoever I want to be. So yes, from that point, yes, if I know the password, then I can pretend to be the access point. But if I know the password, I can't read all the traffic anyway. Right. Well, we'll get to that, actually. Well, there's public key and private key encryption, though. Can you get around that problem that way? So, uh, I don't want to speculate on what could be done, <laughs> but in this situation, uh, yeah. they've chosen to use symmetric encryption, which is not yeah. uncommon because um, private public key encryption comes with its own costs and set of issues. So this setup is un uncommon, but and I want to speculate about ways we could have done better. Yeah, but usually in those situations, they only do the public key, private key exchange to create a secure channel, and then they use that to send the password, yeah. and then do symmetric after that. Yes, yes, but it doesn't buy, it, it, again, not the speculating. The initial handshake may take longer, but after that, it's... And, and it doesn't buy me anything, because if I can't verify the public key, it doesn't buy me anything. Because it, it comes down to, you need what's called a root of trust. You need something that proves to me you are Bruce. If I just accept the random public key, that doesn't help. What proves to me that you are Bruce is the password. You either know the password, mm -hmm. and thus you can prove or pretend to be Bruce, mm -hmm. or you don't know the password, and hopefully there isn't a way to, you know, fix it. You know, so if you have a good protocol, the protocol says, if you know the password, you can be Bruce. If you don't know the password, you can't be Bruce. And then nothing else that you add to that will help. It's all, you know, every, everything else might help protect the password. Mm -hmm. But if you know the password, then you can pretend to be Bruce. Because that's the only thing that I have to identify you with. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? I don't know if that, if that was yeah. clear or not. So, sorry, back to WPA3, unauthenticated encryption. Any other questions? I just want to note before we close out on WPA3, if you notice, 
the whole thing about WPA3 has been dynamically generating this pairwise master key. Instead of the pairwise master key being a set password that exists for a very long time, it has been, you have another way that derives a new pairwise master key that the station and the access point has agreed upon, and then it just goes back into the normal WPA2 flow. I don't know if that was noticed, but in all three modes, the secure handshake is just basically a bunch of steps before the WPA2 handshake to derive a new pairwise master key. With WPS, again, it was a 7 8 bit pin, it was a public key creating a channel, deriving a new pairwise master key. And then unauthenticated encryption, it also ends up creating a pairwise master key and going back into, a, into the WPA2 through a handshake. Uh, there's a bunch about wireless security that we didn't cover. Uh, crack, if you guys haven't heard of it, it was like a big scare for a little while. And that basically goes to how I was talking about sometimes uh, routers will not generate the random nonce, they'll increment the number. Crack was basically replaying packets until the router reused the same nonce twice and then you ended up with a situation where it would help you guess a key. Um, it made a little splash for a little bit in 2018 and then everybody forgot about it. WPS pin brute forcing, we talked about that a little bit. I just don't want to go into like the protocol level details of how that works because you just should not be using uh, WPS. TKIP. TKIP is basically WPS1. If you guys ever see like WPS1 and WPS2, WPS1 was set up to run on the same hardware that would run uh, that basically old web based routers could run on. So it was basically the idea was that oh, we could get the WPA with a firmware update in most places. And so TKIP was kind of not that great of an encryption scheme that was used in the early days of WPA. You see it sometimes, occasionally, but it's almost, you know, by default it's not there anymore. So I didn't think it was worth talking about much. Captive portals. This is when, think of like the hotel or the uh, uh, airport network when you log in and then you know you can't do anything until they show you their page that has their you know, that has their acceptable use policy and you click OK or you have to type in your room number. That's what's called an active portal. I don't want to talk about these because they're not fundamentally wireless issues or protocols, it's just general networking. Like all the things you'll talk about where people are like, oh yeah, I got around, you know, this Airport's captive portal, it's not related to wireless, it's really related to just networking in general. Uh, router specific issues, don't want to get into those because there's just too many. Uh, lesser known issues, so for example, uh, that group temporal key that was used for broadcasts, uh, you can do some fun things with that and create broadcast packets that will let you kind of build a port scanner to see what devices have open ports, even though you can't connect to them directly. Um, and then kind of the quote unquote regular network attack. So we're not gonna talk about like ARP, you know, like after you get onto the network, what do you do? We're not gonna talk about that. You know, ARP spoofing, DHCP poisoning, all that stuff. So, a lot that wasn't discussed, but it's because it's related to wireless, but it's not fundamentally wireless issues. And demo time.